something about, uh, well, one of my favorite subjects that I uh, started with a long time ago. Uh, yeah, um, no, I was asked to give some introductory lectures on legal theory, and uh, for me it's a bit of like uh, travel back in time, so that's uh, things I, I mean, basically things I did, I'm kind of embarrassed to say, but uh, 25 years ago or so. And, um, but anyway, there is new light on that subject, and I think the idea is that, uh, well, confronting it with maybe some of uh, bit older um, results or conjectures uh, might be fruitful in perhaps striving for the progress. I guess that's what the idea is. And uh, so let me start with sort of how I think uh, talks used to start 25 years ago. So, uh, okay, I do have. This is his background, but turned half into a mathematician now, and so good Then physicists would like to write a path integral and would pretend uh, everything is defined by writing things like that. Um, so we want to define certain functions, and uh, we will specify here what they depend on on the way, um, which have the interpretation of being correlation functions of that um, guy called Bilbo theory, so um, they are meant to define something that we call expectation values, <coughs> certain observables called vertex operators, abbreviate VO for vertex operator, and uh, yeah, the path integral quote quote definition will only look something like that. Uh, we interpret it as a um, to be defined integral over maps from, say, the complex plane to the real numbers, so that is uh, this Liouville field phi, weighted by some action, which I will write down in a moment, uh, so exponential of that action, and then the appearance of these observables is uh, as another piece of the integral weight here, uh, like that, to the two alpha phi of zk. Um, I mean, I'm writing here, oh, sorry, uh, k, uh, I'm writing here just argument zk, so this is not meant to be holomorphic if I'm writing zk. Some tradition would rather be to write z, z bar k, but okay, this just takes more time to write, so. Uh, Excuse me, uh, in the vertex operator you have z, and no, upstairs. I can't read the. Is that a K? And this again was meant to be K. Uh, I tend to switch between R and K sometimes. Okay, so yeah, what do we, we need to complete the definition? Maybe let's add it just below. Uh, is uh, what this action functional is. So it's a thing that takes a field that is a map from the complex plane to the real numbers, the Liouville field, and. Uh, takes a number from it uh, by computing this functional here. Uh, we have the gradient of phi uh, absolutely square. We're working in Euclidean structure, and then there is this uh, interesting additional uh, term, which makes it, from the physicist's point of view, an interacting quantum field theory, and thereby introduces all the uh, non-trivialities uh, that this theory has. So. By that, I mean, otherwise it would be a free theory. If we formally would send just mu to zero, it would be free theory. But uh, this is what introduces uh, nonlinearity, making things quite a uh, challenge. OK, so yeah, that would be the usual start. And then one would go on and say, uh, well, but yes, of course, the path integral is not rigorous. We don't know how to do it. But in this case, actually, and that is, I think, here part of uh, the fun nowadays, this is one of the path integrals that have been rigorously defined uh, by now, thanks to the work of uh, uh, François David, uh, Antikupian, uh, Rémi Rodez, and uh, Vincent Vargas. 
and there has been a long series of uh, papers in which um, one by one several of the um, expected results or conjectures from the literature based on that path integral have been derived by now. And uh, what I want to do is well, um, not speak about that because we will have uh, dedicated lectures to that approach. Um, but rather, referring to the book on bootstrap, uh, describe, I mean, at least in this lecture, there won't be time for any like derivations or even sketches of derivations, but describe what we believe to know about the bootstrap and level theory, and then maybe on the way discuss uh, what by now, thanks to the work uh, from based on probability theory, has been turned into uh, rigorous theorems and uh, what still may be an interesting conjecture to look at. And uh, yeah, that's the idea. Okay, so maybe I start from here. Bootstrapish things. Um, so this is a completely different type of uh, strategy, which in principle could, should actually perhaps uh, lead to an alternative construction, which will then might reveal perhaps other aspects. Although it should be said that also here a good part has been made rigorous by now, but there is one crucial thing I want to highlight where it's not so clear. I've seen some announcement uh, in a preprint which isn't yet out. Um, anyway, uh, let's just discuss it when we're there. Good. So the idea is uh, that the bootstrap amounts to construction of these functions that we call excitation <coughs> values or correlation functions. Um, which conceptually is based on an expected property which once you have a construction like uh, uh, probability <coughs> which is by now um, in principle can be proven so it is proven basically using these methods but say the bootstrap philosophy was to basically take this as a um, property which we try to turn into uh, a construction by just um, well, exploiting its consequences. So we want to construct something which has this property and some other uh, features um, uh, and hope that yeah, uh, uh, this gives something that in the end of the day, and that is something non-trivial to be checked in the end, that in the end of the day this <coughs> construction um, can be checked to match properties that uh, you either predict or you prove on the basis of the path integral. So these are completely different like um, conceptual strategies. Uh, this is much more traditional, but um, also in the end it's much less difficult uh, nowadays, even though this is what started the business in many ways. Okay, so what I want to now do is simply to present a description, well, which is really, of course, very much abbreviated uh, of the picture that um, has emerged. So let's put it that way. Results. I'm half mathematician now. Uh, I should say these are partly conjectural, and I will discuss sort of what I think is rigorous and what not. Uh, for this, uh, to simplify life, uh, we consider a somewhat special case, just the case where there are just four of these vertex operators. It turns out this is basically complicated enough. Uh, um, to capture most of what really happens uh, and is challenging in the general case. Uh, it's the so-called four-point function. And furthermore, well, then we have here four variables, zk, k running from one to four. Also, this can be simplified a little bit already exploiting part of what is uh, uh, called conformal environs. So let me just... Um, right here the definition. It turns out this somewhat specialized function will send one of the variables to infinity in a specific way with some 
regular rising factor. Um, and you take your F4 and uh, good, then it depends on say four of these alpha arguments and four of these z arguments and then we put one to one, one just z which is the argument of this guy and one to well, okay, one is sent here to zero. It turns out this knows basically all that we need to know about the function f4 because of conformal invariance. I think this is probably well known to most of you uh, that really this is the object that we need to study. So um, sorry, uh, why do you have to take a limit? Uh, is that one goes to zero instead of just? No, I mean, okay. Yeah, I, I realized it's, <laughs> I started off writing, but of course I could have written immediately like this. There's no, there's no uh, uh, issue here. Yeah, and then <coughs> what the bootstrap does is basically to start constructing this using a certain ansatz and uh, that this type of construction works in the end is by no means obvious, but by now we know that it does work. Uh, so what I'm writing now is one of the things that have been turned into theorems by the work of uh, <coughs> well, many people, <coughs> the work from probability theory, which was initiated in the work of uh, David Kuklein, uh, Hodes, uh, and Vargas. <coughs> so let me write it down. Maybe most of you will have seen it already. And then sort of one by one explain what the ingredients are. Well. Also, this will be somewhat incomplete, but I will focus on, of course, the maybe most interesting parts. Here. So there are, what do we have here? We have a function of three complex variables. These are, well, for those who know and have heard about it, uh, DOZZ for Don Otto, Zomlotchikov, Zomlotchikov, three-point functions. Um, and there's an explicit formula for it, which I wrote down several times in my life, but I won't do it today because uh, we won't really need it. But it's, of course, a key object which really, I mean, this is where sort of most of the physical information about the level of conformal field theory is in. But, yeah, um, anyway, we won't need the explicit expression, but rather we will focus on these guys here which uh, are the so-called conformal blocks. Uh, also this, I suppose, most of you know quite well. <coughs> so this is the type of ansatz, and uh, in principle, if we know the ingredients here, then this can furnish a definition, and we can start checking if it has the required physical properties. Um, <coughs> Yeah, but let's discuss sort of what we know about uh, mostly the conformal blocks. Uh, this I will basically leave as a black box for the lecture, um, but I can assert you we have an explicit formula, which is uh, the main proposal slash conjecture of Don Otto and brother Samlochikov. And, um, well, uh, this uh, indeed has been checked, well, by now proven. It's a paper in the Annals of Mathematics uh, proving that the formula that was conjectured uh, by Don Otto Abramson-Lochikov uh, is, in fact, the result of the path integral that was written down in the beginning, and that is a paper of uh, Kupian, Budes, and Vargas. Um, <coughs> so that is part of the story which is very well understood by now, thanks to probability theory. I will refer to this formula maybe as the formula HF for holomorphic factorization. What is a key feature here is we're writing this as a 
um, absolute value squared, meaning, okay, this is this function times its complex conjugate, where then, of course, the complex conjugate will also affect the variable z. So we have here both holomorphic as well as anti-holomorphic dependence. <laughs> and, um, <coughs> um, yeah, so that, that, that is what we want to discuss. I mean, maybe focusing on the, but let me say, I said it perhaps incompletely that the validity of this formula, the fact that the path integral can be represented in this way is also one of the theorems of uh, Colomb, Guillaume, Wu, uh, anti uh, Remiro Des, and Vincent Vargas, right? That's, uh, in, some, in some domain of alpha mm -hmm. things. In some domain, <coughs> right, there is always, okay, there are several things I will have maybe to skip. Um, uh, there is a very interesting story here about, uh, in particular, the, dependent, the dependence with respect to these alpha variables. Uh, the thing does have a range of analyticity with respect to alphas, um, <clears throat> but then the shape of this formula will change when we go out of this range of uh, analyticity, where still it permits analytic continuation Okay. Let me not go into this too much, but uh, it can be analytically continued in alphas, basically, as a meromorphic function uh, yeah, in alphas. Um, it, has, uh, it has some poles, yeah. yeah. Well, we can deform the contour, this is uh, what is required, but of course the result then doesn't care about which contour uh, uh, we're using as long as it exists, right? So, but there are some teaching cases that can happen. Can I ask a question about yeah. the definition of f? Here, the, the, I, I don't understand the factor of 2. Is, is delta 4 defined by the scaling dimension of the operator or the... Oh, yeah, I, I, I wanted to write here the delta 4 is the scaling dimension and we had introduced this alpha, so I wanted to take the opportunity to introduce here the notation that this delta, <coughs> this delta notation, maybe I really want to write here delta alpha 4, then... Uh, um, this is simply defined as this <coughs> expression. It's more natural to, the vector should be 2 instead of 4. Uh, but it's uh, absolute value square, so there's holomorphic as well as anti-holomorphic. No, it's a, actually it's a half of scaling dimension. Uh, the scaling so dimension is two deltas, basically, ah, okay. because it's kind of half of holomorphic dimension. I see. <coughs> Good. So for now, um, yeah, I, I, I want to talk about conformal blocks. Um, so let me list sort of what we. Um, so basically, it's a list of uh, uh, known or expected conjectured properties of conformal blocks that I want to present in the sense of giving here a survey. Uh, the first thing is I may <coughs> discuss in a bit more detail at the beginning of next lecture, but for the moment I just want to assert to um, conformal blocks, well, the notation of P, uh, just completely Find by representation theory of uh, Virasur algebra. And I'm actually not, well, tomorrow I will have to make my choice. I'm not sure how much I need to discuss this. I suppose most of you will know how that works uh, anyway. But maybe for the sake of comparison, I will tomorrow very briefly review how that works. But it's basically, yes, it's an object uh, of representation theory. <clears throat> and it's fully defined thereby, and so there, well, let me be a bit more specific, that is what I want to do here, namely the form uh, of this guy that I suppose most of you will know well, is as follows, it can be represented, and this is what is defined really by representation theory, that is algebra alone, and uh, my <coughs> theme here is basically to dis disentangle a little bit what is defined by just algebra and what is what requires analysis in some more serious way. Um, 
here is a normalization maybe that I want to specify at this occasion that it is a power series that starts with one to normalize in order to in particular give meaning to this very specific factorization that was in the um, in the holomorphic factorization formula. This is basically what we need to define these three point functions when expanding like this. So, uh, what is really defined by representation theory, that is by algebra, are these guys. So, what it does is to define a formal series a priori. Um, namely, it gives a recursive way, uh, so the, what the representation theory does is to give a recursive way uh, to compute these coefficients here. What it does not tell us is, for example, about convergence uh, to begin with. So, this here is uh, from algebra. And <clears throat> also about this, there's of course a lot of uh, interesting mathematics that one could uh, tell. So, in particular, the famous uh, story of uh, AGT, Alde Gayoto Tachikawa, is about, uh, well, ways to find explicit formulae for these guys. So, by now, I mean, when Conformal field theory was uh, uh, first introduced, uh, well, they understood very well how to recursively compute, basically proving the existence of these uh, coefficients here, which are still functions of five variables and an integer n, but there was no explicit formula for this for a long time, and then uh, this was part of what made uh, the Alvega Gayoto Tachikawa story interesting. It furnished, in particular, for the first time, explicit formulae for these guys. Again, that is one of the things I won't write down here, but let me mention it because uh, I think, yeah, that is part of what this uh, workshop is about to contrast the different aspects and points of view. So, this is sort of where, um, uh, in particular, uh, it connects to the AGT. Conjectures by now theorems, so this is part of uh, the um, results uh, or conjectures of AGT of the work turned into theorems subsequently. Can I ask a question? More yeah. <coughs> is it delta alpha? Is it like alpha? Multiplied ah, by ah alpha? thanks. Thanks. Yes, I need to introduce another notation. I guess, of course. So uh, maybe I introduce here the notation alpha p. Uh, because, yeah, it is convenient to have here a real variable p, which is the same as the integration variable here, right, which we integrate over uh, the positive half line. And <coughs> a standard nuisance here is that, um, well, both notations alpha, which are those which make the v alphas uh, simple, right, so this is why alpha notation is convenient. It makes this uh, vertex operator formula uh, Convenient, whereas then the integration variable is best expressed in terms of p, where it is real. And yeah, okay, we have to live with uh, that there is a change of notation basically in between the two. Uh, what is delta alpha? Delta alpha, okay, yeah, I introduced it in the example of delta alpha 4, but let me repeat. So, yeah, maybe I. Maybe you put did, it did you mention the relation between Q and B? <laughs> thank, thank you, thank you, yes, 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 yes. <laughs> okay, I don't seem to be fully awake uh, this time yet, so yes, I have meant to. So sorry, the question from the mathematician, uh, yeah. the only one probably in the conference who has no clue of physics. <laughs> so, so are we assuming that all the real parts are the same here? So because... The real parts of alphas? Yes, because... Uh, okay, yes, uh, okay, thanks. No, that's a very good question, which brings us back to a discussion. So, we will, or we may, assume real alphas in a certain range defined by inequalities to begin with for the definition of the path integral. Okay. That is, that in this definition was important, which also has to do with something that in physics literature is called cyber bound and things like that. Um, however, it turns out that the result permits analytic continuation in alpha variables in a certain range, and then 
you can continue outside of this range by modifying the integration contour uh, in the solomorphic factorization story. So in the end of the day, what this defines, can define, is a meromorphic function of alphas in the whole alpha plane. So that's, however, one of the non-trivial uh, uh, results that I didn't really want to discuss in detail. So, but maybe, but sorry to important. insist on this. So when, when we define these um, correlation functions, I had an action functional in the integral, and the action functional depends on B. So am I assuming, therefore, that for different, Q, for different Qs, I'll have a different parameter of the theory? Okay. Yeah, let me, let, let, me, let me speak about this. Uh, right. um, so we, we, we have this initial parameter B. Mm -hmm. uh, we assume it to be real to begin with. There is also an interesting story about analyticity with respect to the parameter B. Let me, however, note, as we stress conformal symmetry, and I assume everybody here has at least a basic knowledge of conformal symmetry, well, conformal symmetry, as we will discuss in more detail in the next lecture, has these uh, generators Ln, the generators of the Rosoro algebra, and the central charge C. And the formula then is going to be um, one which is very familiar to you. That is, uh, uh, it looks like, maybe I write this here. Oops. Okay, so which means that uh, when we assume B to be real, then we will have uh, C bigger or equal to 25. Uh, but again, um, one of the interesting features of that we believe to be true based on simply the fact that if we look here, we see only objects that permit analytic continuation also in the parameter B, uh, which basically just parameterizes the central charge, is that this has a certain range of uh, values to which it can be analytically um, uh, continued. Where really there is trouble is when we hit um, the imaginary axis with respect to B. Mm -hmm. That's all I want to say about this now. And uh, okay, maybe I'll swap the board and use this formula if I need it. Sorry. When, I mark, uh, when you write absolute value of mm -hmm. f, probably you mean f of z times f of z bar in a sense it should be analytic in alpha. Right? Yes, so here, okay, so to write it, indeed, I am specializing alphas uh, to be real, say, um, p to be real, and then it is just basically affecting the z variable to make it the z bar. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, good. Um, we have a formal series defined by algebra. That was all basically I wanted to say here. And um, now comes sort of the key conjecture that we believe to be true, but uh, okay, I think not all of them are fully rigorously understood at this time, although it might well be that even, uh, yeah, that, that, that some work in preparation they are. Um, Proving rigorously. So for the moment we're just talking about formal power series and the first conjecture is that they converge. In fact, the expectation is that they converge with a radius of convergence one. Um, if I understand correctly, so for almost all P in the sense of uh, say measure theory, this is a result of uh, uh, Colomb anti uh, Right. Uh, however, I think there is an issue whether they converge for really all P. Mm -hmm. but although there is, I think, in an, another group which for the torus conformal block claims to have proven it by, again, probabilistic methods. <coughs> Somebody else can discuss more precisely the state of affairs. So, in any case, I think in full generality, yeah, uh, it may remain to be uh, better understood. Um, <clears throat> in any case, this was a basic conjecture of the bootstrap all the way long, and uh, somehow physicists never 
I think most physicists had no doubts about it and just took it for granted for all the time. This was my attitude, at least. <laughs> so you mentioned before that the, the explicit formula of a fierce norm of IGT bar, why, why there isn't a cons uh, explicit check for the conversion? No explicit formula for the coefficients, but yeah. you need to estimate the growth with n of the coefficients in order to prove conversion. That's not easy. That's not easy. So uh, Giovanni Felder with a student tried hard. They could do it for what is called the 5D version thereof, where these are rational functions when you replace like geometric functions. There is a proof for some cases. For that case, it didn't work. At least this is, well, I think Giovanni can tell us when he arrives. I think he was meant to come, no? And uh, yes, no, there is an issue. Um, but for the bootstrap, you just need the convergence for almost every p, actually, because it's an integral. True, but uh, there is more, <laughs> like you want to. <laughs> um, what, what about the semi-classical uh, blocks? Is it also that equal one expected? Uh, let's just not talk about okay. it now. Okay. <laughs> let's, let's, it's, it's very interesting, and of course, I'm, I'm not interested in classical conformal blocks, but. Uh, that goes yeah. a bit uh, water than to what I want. Now comes sort of really perhaps the most interesting, I mean, of course, it was based on the previous one, um, the most interesting things that we believe to be true, namely that they admit analytic continuation even to an even larger domain, continuation. Two, yeah, what's the, okay, so here comes sort of the mathematical meaning of the space, which is the Teichmüller space of the four punctured sphere. So don't worry too much if you don't know what this is. Uh, it's the, one way of defining it is the universal cover of the moduli space of complex structures on the four punctured sphere, but as the four punctured sphere has a complex structure just defined by saying where the punctures are, uh, yeah, uh, this is just something very simple and explicit in the end. Namely, it's the Riemann sphere, point zero, one, and infinity removed. So you can take either of these definitions uh, uh, for the following to a concrete idea. Uh, so do you mean the universal sorry. cover of this P1? Uh, oh, yes, I mean the universal cover, of course. Yes, absolutely. <coughs> Uh, Tilde means universal cover. And the first is just a T, cursive T, not a tilde of something. This here is a graphic cal T. Or a type of It's just a single letter. It's, it's just a single letter, letter, yes. Oh, my handwriting seems to be a mess. Uh, uh, trouble distinguishing your twiddles from your calligraphy. Oh, <laughs> Okay, no, I, I cannot, I cannot... Because uh, then you want the right of the universal cover of yes, the modern space, yes, okay? Yes, yes. Well, that's a tweet on the middle. No, it connects and... Uh, yeah. <laughs> the conform blocks, right? Huh? The conform blocks are just Fs. These are Fs, Fs yeah. Uh, this is a um, capital is a uh, with a... Yeah. <laughs> So, okay, so this of course is a already quite non-trivial step beyond just uh, having a function um, which is defined on the unit disk. But uh, even better so, we can describe completely its monodromies, um, thereby specifying completely as a multi-valued analytic uh, function on that Teichmüller space or on that uh, yeah, on that space here. So let's describe the monodromy. Um, we describe it by the existence of basically. Uh, let me write the formula. Um, claim, however, is that uh, um, the monodromy is around. Okay, where where can be monodromies around zero? This is clear by the formula I wrote because there was this prefactor z to the 
delta alpha minus delta alpha one minus delta alpha two. So what happens when we go around zero is obvious. It's just a multiplication. What happens when we go around one or infinity is uh, much less obvious, and that is sort of given by the following formula. Uh, For the, for the zero, I mean, there you're assuming something on the sum of the alpha i's, right? You have like the sum of alpha i's is less than q over 2? Or what? You said that there's no pole around zero? No, 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 no. Okay, so I said, <coughs> let me make it here a little box, right? So if you remember, fp was something like delta alpha minus delta alpha 1 minus delta alpha 2. Yes. Uh, one plus dot dot dot, which are just powers, and this here tells you what this is zero is, namely this explicit fact. Um, good. Explain a few things. We start with the simple things here. We have some tuple of variables, which is uh, if we have the tuple of variables here, um, like that, containing the four alphas, then the one with the tuple is just the one uh, where three and one change places. So it's just uh, uh, yeah, a permutation of arguments that happens here. OK, um, and now I need more space. Maybe I'll do it over there. I mean, what's the point of this relation to begin with? Just looking at it as is, right? So, as we just observed, this guy here has simple, that is, diagonal monodromy around zero. Here, we're writing in the argument, we're replacing in the argument z by one minus z. So, if you replace here z by one, one minus z, you're getting something that has simple monodromy around one. So, therefore, uh, what this formula here uh, describes is basically a change of basis in the space of functions that are labeled by these variables p or p prime, which relates diagonal monodromy around zero to diagonal monodromy around one. So thereby, it is, I think, already clear that a formula of this type does the job to tell us what the monodromy around one is, uh, all the non-trivial part of this integral transformation here um, that describes basically a continuous change of basis um, of this sort. And now, yeah, I want to tell you a little bit about the ingredients to the extent I can. Uh, this cannot be complete at all, but uh, <coughs> let's say something. So, of course, here the most interesting guys are those uh, that is the integral kernel which appears in this relation. <coughs> and uh, I want to give you its form in some convenient representation that uh, on the way was found uh, in the literature. So, okay, let's be here. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, this, what do I, uh, just alpha prime. I need two notations to abbreviate a little bit. This refers here to the variable p and p prime, respectively. So this just is shorthand. And uh, yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, details don't matter so much, but maybe uh, getting some, or oh, actually, actually, it's not even quite correct. Q minus, Q minus. But uh, for example, what does matter is that uh, these uh, three point functions C that we have here appear as normalizing factors, at least in this way of writing the expression. Uh, what is the exponent? It's one quarter. Uh, it's one half. It's the square root we're taking here. Like which we can do. Sorry? Or it looked like an ill. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we have here an M of alpha. So these are measure factors. Um, again, we're taking a square root. And then here comes sort of the main player, perhaps. Alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha people. Alpha 3, alpha 4, alpha prime b. That's the structure of this kernel that we have found uh, some, somewhere on the way in the study of the M of alpha uh, has an explicit formula, the falling form. Uh, if we're using here again, I don't know, I have it uh, there using this formula. Um, Sinch 2 pi p minus 1 p. Uh, I feel inclined to call it the Plancherel density. Uh, that's what it is for a certain quantum. <coughs> okay. So this here, just let me stress, is the same as uh, in this holomorphic factorization formula. And uh, that's basically all we need to know for now. But uh, here, this guy is. Uh, Sorry, I can't see the, the indices on the, uh, the denominator at the top. What is it? It's like C. Here? So, 4, 3, alpha, yeah. then a Q minus alpha, 2, 1. Um, uh, in a way, right, so um, maybe I was to draw a little. Diagram. I mean, there, there, there's a diagram that goes with it. So one, two, three, four, and then you put everywhere alphas. This is what basically explains the structure here of the denominator. And uh, uh, then there is another way of uh, uh, joining these uh, into a tree. Um, which is in relation to the structure here of the numerator. And the point is that uh, this here is a 6J symbol, however, of a novel type. Uh, namely, it's a 6J symbol for um, what is called the modular double of QQ SL2. Um, well, we won't have the time to really now introduce UQ of SO2, what the modular double is, how to do its harmonic analysis, uh, and so on and so forth. But okay, there's a quantum group, something deforming an ordinary group. Uh, it has a representation theory. Um, we can think of tensor products of representations, like for example, R alpha 3 tensor, R alpha 2 tensor. Alpha one, so it has representations labeled by a single continuous variable, and uh, then um, um, <coughs> yeah, and then this story of um, quantum group representation theory now in a more compact case. What it does for us is uh, well, it produces uh, first of all. Um, we can, for example, perform a composition in irreducibles in two different ways, as indicated by this diagram. And uh, we can project onto some intermediate representation that appears in the tensor product decomposition. And this basically forms um, a distributional basis for the space of um, intertwiners from the threefold tensor product to an irreducible representation. Um, well, and we can do it a 
another bracketing which would correspond to this diagram. And uh, so then here he would dec decorate sort of the black with a alpha and alpha prime respectively to uh, indicate the projection onto a specific intermediate representation. And in the end of the day, what the quantum group representation theory gives you is a relation between these two types of bases in the um, space of, uh, say, uh, environs, or no, well, um, the space of uh, vectors um, from threefold tensor products to irreducible representations. So it gives a change of basis, and the uh, representation of this change of basis involves objects of this form. Of course, they have to know about the four verbals. So at the end of the day, we want to project onto a representation of a four. So it needs to know about these four um, basically externally specified and fixed representations as well as on how we project here in intermediate steps. I mean, all this is way too brief to be understandable, I'm sure, but uh, yeah, just one second, then I come to your question. Uh, what I want to indicate is there is a, by now, I think, uh, pretty well understood chapter of mathematics defining this here as a meromorphic function of all its six variables. Okay, so, and the type of mathematics is representation theory of quantum groups here, a non compact quantum group. Okay, so now your question. So if I think from the point of view of topological string or supersymmetric edge theory, this is like a change of frame, right? From, uh, let's say... Um, this is a very interesting direction to think about, but it hasn't yet been understood in this way. Um, I believe, yeah, there is a chance to give it an uh, interpretation of this type. Yeah, yeah, because what I was thinking is that, I don't know, there is, was this old paper by Aganagic, Bouchard and Clem, but there, the change of frame, it's, this FPP seems much simpler. But I'm not sure if it's because they consider P1 times P1, so it's like yeah. generation of this. Uh, I guess, right, so the subtlety here is whether you want to think about open topological string theory or closed topological closed. string theory, where here in the closed topological <coughs> string theory. And indeed, yes, it should be a change of frame. I mean, okay, we would be in the limit of, say, the, um, well, this is this, this, uh, Hirzebuch surface corresponding to Pernod V6, yeah. as you know, and um, there, indeed, there should be a story of change of, uh, of frame where exactly this would be applicable, yes. Yeah, yeah no, this is, uh, I, I think it would be worth maybe spelling this out. It sounds like a very interesting idea, yes, indeed. <sighs> okay, let me take a breath. So. Okay, here I'm mumbling a lot about uh, uh, how these guys are defined, but let's now just assume we know what these guys are. I'm feeling good about it, but anyway, that's the best I can do for now. So these are rigorously defined mathematical objects from the theory of this quantum group. Uh, what is another story is about whether we know uh, that such a relation exists in the first place and whether we know that these are the coefficients that appear in it. That is, right, so definition of this thing from quantum group representation theory I would call rigorous, case closed. Here, I would like to understand what the current status is, to be honest. Um, so the purpose of tomorrow's lecture is maybe to outline one old-fashioned way, sort of, I derived it based on certain conjectures of analytic nature. So this is not what I claim to be a fully rigorous story. But anyway, it worked and it led to a very systematic calculation. And the calculation gave a very precise formula for this, these coefficients here, which is what is standing here. Right? So note, everything here is defined. There is nothing like uh, 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 undefined in it. Everything is defined. So it may be that in probability theory, this is a theory by now or close to becoming a theory. I've seen a preprint on the homepage of, uh, what's it? I think, Guillaume Remy, 
But I also heard that maybe they had some issue that needed to be fixed about the derivation of this formula based on probabilistic approach to boundary level theory and so on and so forth. I don't know, maybe Evelina can comment uh, if she knows. Um, in any ways, so it might be already a theorem or close to a theorem, but I just don't know for sure. Uh, and what I would like to stress, and that is maybe perhaps the main point of my lecture, how important it is, so how much of like beautiful mathematics uh, is in it, but also uh, how important it is for the bootstrap approach uh, to the conformal, uh, the level conformal theory. I think it's based on the, boundary, the bootstrap for the boundary Liouville theory, which is not completely done yet. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think there is hope that uh, if one does based on probability theory, the bootstrap or boundary level theory, then uh, this formula can come out as a corollary. That would be great. And uh, this is just basically, then from this point of view, this is uh, uh, what I want to get across, that uh, this would be one of the most important, uh, perhaps, achievements of this, uh, this line of research. Um, but nevertheless, even if this is maybe other perspectives on this formula might be revealing because they might reveal other uh, aspects of the story. So in particular, you know, okay, there's on the one hand this link here that I would like to stress uh, to the 6J symbols, which makes a connection to quantum group theory uh, somewhat uh, boldly. I would say this is the basis for something you could call the kaftan lustig type theorem for Verisoro algebra. That is, there is a distinguished series of representation of the Verisoro algebra where indeed we have these values, I mean, associated to these values. Um, which we could call the principal series of Verisoro. And uh, kashtan lustig type theorems basically claim equivalences of uh, braided tensor categories of representations, uh, one defined using vertex operator algebras here, Verisoro algebra, the other defined using quantum group theory. And what is sort of shining up here is that there is something of this sort in the non-compact situation where everybody here is a continuous variable. That is point one that is sort of behind and that, that might be nice to understand better. And second, this is the basis for understanding the link between Liouville theory and quantum Teilhänder theory. Because uh, yeah, these objects have um, an interpretation in quantum Teilhänder theory. And, uh, yeah, let me just leave it with this. Uh, suppose, uh, here's a very naive question. Suppose for some reason that I'm unhappy that UQSL2 appears here and I want some higher rank uh, object. What, and if I rewound your, your description to the beginning, what, what should I so change? Okay. Uh, yeah, you should start from something, well, you know, TODA, it's called TODA theory. Uh, there's a list of generalizations of the Liouville action where you take your favorite root system and you write down some exponential interactions uh, uh, labeled by that root system, and you have more than one field, you have as many fields as you have. Uh, Cartan directions of your Lie algebra and so on. So this defines a class of quantum field theories called the conformal Toda field theories. Mm -hmm. That's what we would start from. However, then if you go to the bootstrap, then things are getting much more interesting. And uh, well, some in the audience can tell perhaps better than I can the state of affairs. The, the main point there is uh, about the vertices, you're going to have um, infinite dimensional spaces of intertwiners then. And you have to include into these integrations here over intermediate representations also integrations over intertwiner spaces. And OK, there are some steps in this direction in the literature, but I think the whole story is much less well understood. Well, not really, not really well understood. What would be the names of people working on this? Uh, some are in the room. Um, uh, well, uh, Sasha Litvinov has worked on it with. Uh, working on these Toda theory theories. Okay. Can you say? Working on this Toda field theories. Uh, I'm with Colin Guillermo, we're working on this uh, conformal bootstrap and trying to prove this 
four point function from three point okay. function. So, uh, Please give us the up-to-date uh, information and list of names. I might, uh, I know of course, yeah. I believe most of them, but I might miss one and then I would be terribly embarrassed. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay, so, well, um, how about time? Um, I think the hour is... Uh, yeah. About the continuation on uh, B, yes. imaginary B. At the level of the conformal block, uh, it's an easy continuation. I mean, block. Yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah, at that at that level, it seems complicated. Well, While you should the trouble is here, right? Somehow, hmm? the trouble is here. The conformal yes, blocks. So, 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 as you know well, uh, conformal yes. blocks they just continue all the way. See, uh, bigger, smaller than one. Uh, these guys don't. And uh, something that usually uh, happens when you go to see smaller than one, uh, and it's a very interesting story, and there's presumably some duality. Okay, we don't have time, but uh, it's extremely interesting, but, um, yeah, and it has to do with, um, I mean, there is this representation theory of quantum group. This is particularly simple in line in this range of values where B is real. And you can continue a little bit. But uh, on the other hand, uh, as you may expect, uh, the parameter then somehow analytic properties, for example, normalizability, uh, completeness of uh, um, a basis, uh, of a distributional basis in a space of functions, can change a lot with respect to the parameter B or Q. Well, Q, by the way, would be simply here in the expression. Um, yeah. Uh, room. Even here, there's room for, for better understanding from this point of view. And, uh, yeah, okay, yes, uh, let's, uh, let's so, discuss. Uh, what is the expected uh, range of validity of, of that formula in terms of B or, or P? Um, good, yes, we have basically here what we need, right? So this here just continues, no problem. But here, let's look at this guy. And uh, yes, now we have here, okay, this here is already signaling trouble, but also I wasn't very explicit about this guy. It is built from some kind of uh, Q hypertrometric integral from, uh, built from this um, FADF non-compact quantum dialogarithm. And also this has an issue, uh, so it is, uh, the nice continuation when B is in the Y half plane, but on the B, imaginary B axis, uh, bad things can happen. And uh, yeah, I would like to understand better what exactly happens there and uh, sort of what can be re the replacement on that line or on the other side uh, is again a story of uh, the type that, that I was uh, asking for. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, maybe we can just continue with the question on then, because it's a bit... Uh, yeah, I mean, okay, so formally <laughs> my time is up. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know yeah, if so you want to give me some extra, but we could also just make a cut here and continue tomorrow. That's fine. Yeah, maybe so we that's... can thank okay. Jörg for the very okay, nice yes. talk. Um, <laughs> and then if you have other questions, maybe? Second lecture on introduction to the UBL CFD. Yeah, thanks a lot <coughs> for the introduction. And uh, let me start with a correction. Uh, I said that uh, convergence of these uh, series defining conformal blocks is unknown. This was wrong, I learned. Uh, so I we're going to hear a talk by Paolo Arnaldo this morning. So watch out for this talk. Uh, that's, of course, a beautiful and important result uh, on foundation. Sorry. Um, okay, so yeah, I had a hard time deciding what to talk about next. Um, good, so the first lecture basically was describing some key mathematical characteristics of uh, legal theory in a well, descriptive manner. And for now, I decided to go back uh, even further in history and basically start in the 19th century or so. Um, the idea being that. Well, there is in principle a systematic approach to develop the whole theory really by solving the thing, starting from the classical solution, quantizing, and so on. And this, in 
well, like 24 years ago, uh, I tried to develop into a like, full solution of the quantum Liouville theory. I didn't fully succeed because in the end of the day, and well, we probably won't have much time to discuss, uh, there are sort of uh, <coughs> foundational aspects of analytic nature that uh, I wasn't able to settle, but yet there's a computation and in the end it produces very precise results and these are the results I described yesterday and they have received by now a lot of support, so I think there's some truth in, in, in this method, and I think it is worth uh, discussing it, maybe revisiting it, and maybe now uh, with methods like from probability theory or maybe some other extra analytic input, it's time to <coughs> make this a rigorous mathematical story, and I think the potential of this approach would be <coughs> that it can serve as a connection between various ways. I mean, basically, all the four ways uh, uh, to conformal field theory that we're discussing at this conference, I believe, can be connected through this uh, approach, which basically, I mean, one name would be uh, to call the free field approach by basically starting from the classical mapping of uh, field theory to free field theory and then trying to rebuild everything from there. Okay, so let me really start from scratch. So in principle, you can forget everything that we discussed uh, yesterday, and uh, it's a completely new start I'm making here. We're going to study this theory called Liebel theory now on space times, um, where space is a circle and time uh, on the real line as usual, and. Uh, field theory, okay, what is it defined by? There is an equation of motion which I write in terms of light cone coordinates. So I'm taking these combinations, uh, x plus minus, uh, uh, what are my conventions? No. <coughs> and the corresponding derivatives, uh, minus mu e to the two five. This is a nonlinear partial differential equation whose uh, solution theory basically well, uh, is uh, pretty well understood. So we can write down the solution straight away. Um, well, this is what in the 19th century basically was known to Livo, hence the name. Um, and, uh, okay, I will comment. It's basically a parameterization in terms of some uh, almost arbitrary, and I will describe what almost means here, uh, functions A plus and A minus. Oh, sorry, now I'm starting to rush already too much. So that is a function of light cone coordinate X plus. That's the function of light cone coordinate uh, X minus. And here in the later we have A plus of X plus minus A minus of X minus squared. Okay. Um, so what, so these functions are almost arbitrary, but almost means there are some conditions, uh, okay, to be maybe in a relatively safe situation. You may want to assume they're smooth, but um, this can be weakened <coughs> somewhat, but that's not something I can discuss here. Monotonic, that's important. And uh, without loss of gener generality, uh, we can assume it to be quasi-periodic. Um, <coughs> so which here concretely means a plus minus of uh, x plus 2 pi uh, is uh, e to the 4 pi p. Here, this is a constant, which is a characteristic of the solution that will play some important role in the following. So, it is part of the data uh, that uh, parameterize solutions. Okay, so these are the conditions. Otherwise, uh, these functions a plus minus are arbitrary, so you choose functions a plus and a minus satisfying uh, these conditions, you plug it into the formula and out comes the solution to this uh, nonlinear equation we aim to solve. All right, <coughs> so that is not yet uh, the free field parameterization, but it is just around the corner, uh, because uh, as it is monotonic, well, uh, we know 
derivative is positive, uh, therefore we can, I mean the derivatives are positive, therefore we can uh, write them as exponentials of some other functions. This is basically a way to solve this monotonicity condition and uh, here basically enter the say alternative data we want to use that we call the free fields. Um, so it's a reparameterization of these initial data and we then henceforth will take these data as being the basic data from which to construct <coughs> solutions. <coughs> now uh, here, okay, uh, these are functions Good, uh, uh, we have this quasi-periodicity condition and quasi-periodicity <coughs> condition turns into a quasi-periodicity condition then also for this function phi plus minus. However, here it was of multiplicative nature when we take basically a log uh, to get uh, then, uh, uh, yeah, so it turns into a quasi-periodicity for these functions phi plus minus of additive nature, which is contained basically in the following representation or expansion that we can always um, use in this context, where here that is the same p as there. Uh, you shift this here by amount of p phi, it produces an additive shift by p, which then is consistent with we have over there, and the rest must be periodic, um, so can be expanded in Fourier series, a n plus minus uh, e to the plus minus uh, i n x plus minus <coughs> not equals to zero. So basically here we're introducing an infinite collection of numbers serving as uh, the data parametrizing classical solutions. Okay, I mean, of course, uh, I have to be a little quick here uh, in the discussion of uh, whatever conditions and so on, but I think yeah. maybe most important is that you get the gist of it here that we have in this way introduced a very concrete set of data. Um, we will talk about Poisson structures and so on, all this will be very convenient uh, in terms of these data. Uh, but before we do that, let me note a useful rewriting, because that's going to play an important role in the reconstruction. Uh, we aim for um, in the following. Um, it's just yet another repackaging which reveals some of the structures of this uh, classical solution. Uh, maybe now I start emitting arguments typically in the formulae of these functions. Um, again, monotonicity makes this positive, so it makes sense to uh, take square roots and so on allowing us to define um, some functions f1 plus minus and uh, another pair of functions. This may look a little um, ad hoc and not very well motivated at this point, but uh, it will, I just can promise you, it will be very useful at some point. We are, somehow we're introducing <coughs> a key player in this business, which is related to Many of you may know under the name of a screening charge, but here <coughs> it, well, I didn't leave enough space. Uh, <coughs> uh, so it has this concrete uh, formula in terms of these um, phi plus minus fields. <coughs> uh, okay. to the 4 3 minus 1 <coughs> integral from <coughs> plus minus to plus, plus minus plus 2 pi dy and then e <coughs> to the phi plus minus of x plus minus. Okay, maybe we give it a name already uh, because also this serves to indicate relations to things that some of you will know from different but related contexts, so that's the <coughs> charge. And in a sense, uh, here, this rewriting... Um, what depends on y in the interval? Uh, what depends on y? Yeah, this guy must depend on y, thanks. Uh, 
It's just your Y. Is a factor of two missing in the exponential? Because you already find DA. Yeah, you're right. Uh, there's a factor of two missing, absolutely. Yeah. <coughs> I mean, okay, just integrating this formula, right? So, yes. <coughs> Right, so I don't know, it's better to maybe I'll continue there, leave some of it on the board. Uh, no, one thing I wanted to add here because then we have all the relevant uh, formulae uh, in one glance. The point about this rewriting is, uh, and this is sort of a kind of nice structure that you uh, see in this parameterization, it allows you to. Um, rewrite uh, to represent the exponential of this level the acting one that we're after in the form like this. F2. Excuse me. <coughs> you have two types of phi in these deposits. I have two types of phi, yes, absolutely. Okay. Uh, there's an interacting phi and there's a free phi, and I want to distinguish them very clearly. So there's yeah, an but... R phi in LaTeX, uh, so there is this guy. And the phi here, this is the level field which satisfies the nonlinear equation. Oh, okay. That's the dimensions here. Yeah, what you discover here is that this exponential basically can be represented in terms of these F12 fields in the form of some something that is basically an SL2R environment. So if you act on F1 by uh, an SO2R transformation and then uh, the conjugate on F2 minus, then this thing will stay environment, which is an important feature. It indicates already that SO2R is a sort of uh, a, a hidden symmetry here. A symmetry is maybe not quite the right word, but in any case, uh, it has to do with the quantum group structure UQSO2R that it has. It kind of, in a very like a faint way, it shows up in this expression, and this is why F12 fields are useful uh, for something and reveal something of the structure. Okay, so that maybe we want to keep in mind for a moment. We want to use it and as a kind of guiding <coughs> observation in the reconstruction a little later. Um, but in any case, yeah, what we have reached here is the, what is called the free field representation of the phase space. <coughs> um, not sure if I need this remark. There is um, a certain ambiguity here. <coughs> we, could, uh, we could introduce a second, maybe I make a remark at least briefly. Um, a certain ambiguity. Namely, I could introduce alternatively, so this A is an important carrier of information that um, um, captures a lot of the, I mean, basically knows. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, that's how I. Um, so I can introduce a modified A tilde by simply inverting A plus minus. <coughs> and uh, I could express. Everything also in terms then of A tilde, I can uh, define from it a phi tilde and so on. So there's not just one free field that parameterizes the level field. There's a second one, which are related by um, some reflection. And that has to do with, um, well, the scattering theory picture that we uh, saw in uh, the yesterday's talk. Um, <coughs> Anyway, if this, this for the moment has to be just a side comment. Uh, the point is that um, the ambiguity can be fixed uh, by imposing the additional condition that P is supposed to be bigger than zero. So in some sense, um, the <coughs> negative values of P uh, uh, would parameterize the representation of one and the same solution. Right, so, yes? 
uh, if I consider like also complex solutions. So I, I yeah, for the no, we're, we're, we're real, right? Uh, yeah, just yeah. to be clear. Uh, yeah. But you could also talk about complex solutions in some extension of the story, yeah. yeah. And it is, uh, so you have like one series that is uh, just a shift, like uh, see this, uh, some, some shift because it, it is exponential. No, no, yeah, this, the classical solution of plus the e pi, yeah. an integer is also a solution of <coughs> complex plane. So you, you, uh, and then uh, you have, uh, I mean, like if this, uh, this parameterization allows, because I know that there are also other, uh, other solutions, but no, I never understood. There are other solutions, uh, and I didn't take the time to sort of discuss uh, all the fine print, but the claim is for smooth, non singular, real valued solutions on the cylinder, that's all. Uh, however, of course, if you start weakening conditions, so for example, it is a very interesting story to allow certain types of singularities, as you can do, that can be very interesting and it has to do with what you're after, say that you then shift to uh, things, the P by maybe some imaginary integer amounts and things. So there's uh, definitely room for various extensions, but here it's a very clear and clean story, basically, like, okay. that we uh, discuss. All right, um, so okay, uh, 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 the remark was, if we impose this, the relation, I'm, I'm here very schematic, uh, the relation between phi and uh, this war phi, so maybe I introduce here the phi as simply being the sum of phi plus plus phi minus, which is a free field. Um, so, if we impose this, uh, the relation is 1 to 1. <coughs> it's 2 to 1 if we allow uh, the negative values. Good. Um, and to round off that story... I should discuss the Poisson structure, because that's, of course, in many approaches... Uh, basic starting point for quantization, we can introduce a conjugate momentum to the Liouville field in the usual manner, namely as uh, the time derivative of phi uh, at some fixed time t, for example, equals to zero. And then a Poisson structure is defined by distributional um, um, uh, Poisson bracket relations Falling form, uh, where again we, we, we're always now here um, imposing this uh, condition. Uh, so this defines on the space of data uh, uh, that we're considering that parameterize the classical solutions a Poisson structure, and then I can introduce a certain functional. It should be war phi here, not, not the straight. No, I want the straight here. And then I want to make a statement about how this is related to the Poisson structure for war phi. That's, that's the point. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, <clears throat> so what is it? One half. It's a functional, uh, again taken all at time t equals to zero. And uh, yeah, this generates the time evolution of any observables in the usual form of, a, say, uh, a Poisson bracket relation. So if this is any functional of my fields phi and pi phi, then by taking the Poisson bracket defined here, with a functional h called Hamiltonian defined here, it tells me how uh, this observable is supposed to vary in time. Okay. So now we have a Poisson structure uh, defined on this space. And uh, uh, the claim is going to be, okay, which I maybe just say in words, that. Um, by using this map uh, that we defined, 
and imposing this condition in order to get a one-to-one -one relation. Uh, so this is, of course, a little subtlety that needs to be properly dealt with. Um, this turns into the Poisson structure for the wire phi, uh, where we drop here this term, but otherwise we have the same form of the relations of uh, uh, defining the Poisson structure. So it's a Poisson map uh, between um, well, the space of initial data for the Liouville field and uh, the free field subjected to this additional condition that P is positive. Okay? Okay, so that's the classical story, and now I want to take this as basically the starting point for a reconstruction program of the quantum theory. But maybe quickly I'll pause for questions so far. How do we go about it, and what are sort of some key ideas? So, uh, well, the strategy is going to be as follows. So now we want to work backwards. So we quantize, and that, of course, is very well known: um, uh, the free field war five. And then, yes, the main need, the main difficulty is uh, in the construction in this strategy of uh, objects called V alpha of uh, uh, plus x minus here, which I think of as being the exponentials, the quantized versions of the exponentials. From, uh, well, from Wi-Fi. You know, this you remember, well, we wrote down a path integral in the beginning of the first lecture. So these are the same guys it was, as what appears in the path integral. So it is now about constructing them, say, from uh, explicit building blocks uh, in order to have a uh, perhaps more explicit <coughs> way of solving the theory from first principles. And then basically, uh, well, we can, and that I checked uh, some, oops, uh, yes, that's what I meant, the alpha, the alpha, and the alpha is to zero. So, um, uh, yeah, some time ago I checked that, okay, <coughs> this here is successful and satisfies uh, some of the required properties that I will briefly mention on the way. And in fact, this does make sense as a kind of uh, last step of the reconstruction of the Leibold field proper. Uh, okay, we just basically try to invert this relation in order to reconstruct this given the family of uh, the alphas where alpha uh, can be real. Okay, so that's the strategy. And now let's uh, sort of uh, list a few steps in the realization of this method. Okay, so step A is standard, so let's be very quick. Um, when we have a Poisson algebra now for the Wi-Fi, and uh, I claim there's a, a Poisson isomorphism basically uh, defined by um, this map between uh, the acting field and the free field that we constructed. So. This is the Poisson structure for war phi. And we know how to quantize it uh, and to define a non commutative algebra that we denote by AF for free field. 
defined again in a distributional sense, uh, and of course, uh, yeah, that's pretty standard how to interpret it uh, rigorously. Um, following form, so now Boson bracket has turned into a commutator. We would typically introduce a parameter uh, named h bar in the process, but now we uh, like to call it b rather than h bar where this b will end up being the same b as appeared in the first lecture. <coughs> and yeah, then uh, uh, we can write the free field. Uh, maybe, okay, here I want operators now, so or generators of that non-commutative algebra. <coughs> This, this is a little formal now, but okay, here really there's no trouble. This is really well understood how to understand all this rigorously. Uh, so, okay, so this is uh, just a reparameterization now uh, of this long commutative algebra, uh, and uh, then. <laughs> Basic generators that are defined thereby, they satisfy um, very standard and well known commutation relations. This, um, and we have in addition these uh, all important zero modes, um, which in my convention satisfy these relations. B square in the commutation relations? Uh, yeah. Uh, it should <coughs> somehow. Okay, I thought, okay, these are very old nodes. Um, just, I think you just rescaled the file. It's, it's just a rescaling that we introduced. Uh, new file is kind of B times the old file. Okay. I may not be able to fix it precisely right here online, but uh, 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 yes, there is. Uh, there, uh, it can be fixed. Right in the second. The A bar, yes, for sure. Uh, I have a question. So, why did the plus minus go away? Because Warfi had a plus and minus modes. Oh, okay, so here's, uh, here's x plus minus. Uh, so the Warfi. Uh, was defined as a phi plus plus a phi minus contribution. Now we just put them together. And yeah. There's one part here depending on x plus and one part depending on x minus. And this here is just the sum of x plus and x minus. So that's, that's how it goes. Uh, but the Q had a plus minus before. Mm -hmm. OK. okay that is a that's a smallish <laughs> point that I like to skip. <laughs> it's not a big deal, uh, okay. you know, but yes, indeed, uh, one has to. A priori, sort of uh, phi plus and phi minus have uh, independent cues, and in the end of the day, you need to impose a constraint that identifies them uh, also as quantum operators in order to uh, write down the, the solution. So that's roughly the, the, the story here. This has to do with the, uh, yeah, that the Pairing between holomorphic and holomorphic on left and right uh, should be diagonal. That is, uh, there should be always so we have one representation in uh, for the chiral part. It should be matched with the same representation for the antichiral. There's a kind of constraint on Q plus being effectively equal to Q minus, and uh, to properly formulate it precisely uh, is a tiny bit of headache, but not. Really. <laughs> Sorry, should I um, should yeah. have E hat as uh, being like pi, like associated operator? Pi. pi. Pi was the momentum. The momentum was a field so as an x dependence. Um, the p was the thing that appeared in the quasar quasi periodicity oh, okay. property. And this is a, say, distinguished uh, degree of freedom, also referred to as zero mode, which we somehow want to distinguish. Now it carries a hat in order to indicate it's a generator of this non-commutative uh, 
So this is this is why hat. Otherwise, it's, it's the P. Okay. I can ask a question. So yeah. if we plug uh, Wi-Fi into the actual <coughs> the reverse, a classical reverse theory, is it exactly the same as free field uh, Lagrangian? Yeah, in, in the Lagrangian, the Warfi, the Lagrangian for Warfi would be the free field Lagrangian. Yes, from your claim, I only see that the, the classical equation motion are the same. In, in that. Okay. In the end, yes, you need to do some work in order to okay. map every. I mean, we, we're doing here Hamiltonian formalism, and you need to do the little exercise to relate Hamiltonian to Lagrangian formalism to, to answer the question that you're asking. So I'm, I'm just have to be quick here to, to get the main. Okay, now what we need is a representation of uh, AF. So here now, basically, some analysis starts entering because we want a Hilbert representation, and that's uh, very important. So uh, the space here, Hilbert space, uh, we denote HF, and uh, here it's defined. Um, it's an L2 of R tensor, what is called a Fox space. And uh, okay, I think most of this is, is very standard and familiar. Um, but let me write sort of the main uh, points uh, briefly. There is a distinguished vector in Fox space which generates everything and satisfies uh, the for n bigger than zero, and uh, then uh, you build by acting with the a n's and a bar n's, which have negative indices, you build from this distinguished vector, uh, also called the reference state or Fock vacuum, a generic state um, f. And L2 of r is just L2 of r. Um, we can think of it as being represented by functions psi of q, Q now being here uh, what corresponds to this in the classical case, so such that then Q hat uh, psi of Q is Q psi of Q, and uh, uh, P uh, would be represented by P squared over I, so here P squared reappears. Uh, yes, I, I probably simply meant to. Well, probably there's a little bit of slightly annoying, but okay. Um, I, I, in this case, at least by this, it's also going to put here. And let me note here, uh, by Fourier transform, of course, we can turn from the representation where Q hat is diagonal um, to the representation where p hat is diagonal, and this would amount to a direct integral decomposition um, of this form. So basically, these are all isomorphic copies of one and the same Fox space, and this index p here only indicates that um, p hat f of p uh, is just represented, p hat is just represented diagonally on f of p. Okay, so that's now the Hilbert space with a standard Hilbert structure, and that is what we want to work on in order to find some analytic objects. The equations for the vector v in the Fox space, the a n, what, the a bar, what okay, is so this? This here is just too much, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, then it's an index n, and for n bigger than zero, it okay. is supposed to any. That's it, okay. <coughs> Right, so yeah, now comes sort of perhaps the main idea in this approach. Uh, because we turn to our main problem, and uh, uh, this is the, the, the solution being proposed uh, with some non standard uh, elements. So the main problem is the step B in our program. So we want to revisit uh, just classically. Um, e to the 2 alpha phi, how it looks in terms of these f1, f2, uh, plus minus uh, building blocks. 
Um, okay, let's just do it and observe something, and then we will interpret and use this. Um, Okay, first I told you what e to the minus phi, this has a very simple expression in terms of f1 plus minus. Uh, no, here is plus, here is minus, and then it makes sense. And then we're taking this to the minus 2 alpha. Okay, so that's basically what we had seen before, now uh, to the power uh, 2 alpha. Um, well, uh, I made this remark that uh, we could equally well use, instead of these guys here, uh, some f1. <coughs> and, uh, instead of f2, we can use what I called f2 twiddle, um, just obtained by inverting a as a parameterization. Um, the point was that, uh, okay, let me remind of the formula look like precisely to be not to create confusion so yeah let me put it down here um, this uh, a plus minus tilde uh, definition as 1 over a plus minus uh, what it amounts to is um, to introduce f2 twiddle plus minus as a minus f1 plus minus and uh, f1 plus minus twiddle as a minus f2 plus minus. Okay, that's related to this ambiguity in the parameterization. The advantage is that, okay, rather than having here this uh, kind of uh, uh, yeah, well, one, one, of the one of the ways to write environment, uh, SO2 environment form is replaced by another way of doing this, where we have here, this is 1, 1, and 2, 2, respectively, plus, minus, plus, minus. This is why alpha. Uh, Nothing has signed, signed, right? Hmm? There should be a sign flip. Uh... Well, no. Uh, or yes, 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 yes. Thanks, indeed. It's, it's even in my note. Yeah. Also minus in front of the first. Uh, it's still a difference. <coughs> Sorry, here you wrote FF plus FF oh, uh, minus FF. Yeah. So probably it should still be minus. You're right. Uh, should, I think it should be minus FF plus FF. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, minus F F. Well, yes, uh, but okay. Is it is it clear? It doesn't really matter. Uh, yeah. Okay. okay. Anyway, uh, that's maybe. That's, uh, yeah. Um, yeah. And then we observe that can be we can factor out maybe. So so somehow the point is to uh, note how it depends on this uh, A guy here, which we call screening charge, and which uh, uh, plays an important role in free field representation and also in many other contexts. So we can write it like this. And then minus A, uh, A to the plus minus, minus 2 alpha. And then we now continue this computation with a uh, okay, now of course you feel tempted to just uh, use something like binomial expansion here in order to represent it as a series. I'm going to argue that this is not what we want to do, but uh, what is much better is in fact there is an alternative to the binomial expansion as an integral. Uh, I mean, rather than expanding in integral powers, we can expand in imaginary powers. And that is much better. Why is it much better? You can anticipate. Because here, well, these are going to be quantum operators containing something like, for example, e to the q. So it's proportional to e to the q. Integer powers, expansion in integer powers of this, say, as the quantum operators, you have no reason that this is, uh, to expect that this is a good operator. If, however, you have something here like... Uh, to the IS <coughs> you have the unitary operators, and that looks like much more promising. What about F? You wrote F1, F1 bar. Why is it related to tilde? Uh, tilde. And the 
this. Okay, so I'm starting to rush, and I shouldn't. <coughs> Good. So, uh, okay, this just as a meager motivating words to to argue that really we do want something binomial life, but now the integral version of binomial expansion, which looks as follows, and, and here we have a plus tilde minus uh, to the power minus. S and okay, uh, I chose here to integrate among imaginary axes for some reason because then, well, this S which appears here uh, deserves to be called screening number, which found now ever is imaginary. <coughs> so we can do that and then say finally we can just reassemble this into the following form. And now I should swap the boards. Final outcome more visible uh, to by uh, there are some coefficients, uh, say some continuous version of binomial coefficients uh, of, uh, to alpha. And then, yeah, we see here nicely uh, something that exhibits basically a precursor of this holomorphic factorization that we've seen in the mathematical description. Uh, of, uh, say, conformal blocks uh, in the last lecture, tilde minus this thing to the minus 2 alpha and uh, a tilde to the power s, and also with uh, the minus index. I probably wanted to draw this to simplify notation. So what we discover here is something, some combination f alpha s, uh, so we just give it a name and observe this depends only on x plus variable and uh, this depends only on f uh, minus variable. And here now maybe it's just to simplify notations, I just put bar rather than tilde and plus minus. Um, that's now classical building blocks. Okay, so this is just an observation of a classical solution, and the uh, point is going to be that uh, there is a good can there are good candidates for quantum counterparts of these guys, which are now slightly more sophisticated objects. But the strategy is going to be to simply take an ansatz of the same form where we replace these guys by their quantum counterparts, and then try to find the quantum deformation of these coefficients in such a way that the result has all the desired properties. Yeah, I would say what uh, the most important thing <coughs> is. Mm. May I ask, I mean, in this Melon Bars representation, you're certainly willing to close the counter at the right half plane on your left. Yes. But you, I, mean, I don't see from the... I don't want to do that, <laughs> but yeah, uh, I can. <laughs> but in order to return back to, the, to this... Uh, yeah. You certainly choose one, one then, right? <coughs> no, 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 I mean, we, 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 we want respond. to work with this integral along real axis uh, because uh, if we think of um, the objects in here as quantum, I mean, we really think of uh, this guy here containing this uh, to the Q observable now. Uh, now it appears basically in to the power s, uh, which is imaginary, so it's a unitary operator, so it's uh, much better behaved, whereas e to the q as operator on L2 of r is a somewhat badly unbounded operator. Uh, it's a tricky guy. We don't want to expand in the tricky guy. We want to expand in well-behaved unitary guys. That's, that's sort of the main philosophical idea here. But we don't want to do any closure of contours here. But, yeah, but uh, still, you have to show that what you did is just a no, okay, but this is uh, okay exercise. And, but but uh, <laughs> that's 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 easy. You can say that it depends on the phase of a plus l to the minus, right? But phase? No, okay. Everybody's real here now for us. But if it, if it is real, there's no. Um. Okay, so I'm using here, of course, an identity of special functions, which is a say continuous integral version of this uh, binomial theorem. 
and this item. Maybe we just put it into the left side and then sum up all, all, all sort of gamma functions, gamma s. Yeah, I mean, okay. It's exactly okay. Let's, let's, that's a way to prove it. <coughs> yes. But if you close it in another direction, you will have everything, but a plus will be inverted. Everything will be inverted. Uh, yes. So it's somehow related to this reflection you mentioned? Yeah, 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 yeah. Ah, it's yes. probably related to this reflection ah, and we have sort of, um, um, I mean, it's a, a, a redundancy of parameterization. There are sort of ah. two equivalent ways to parameterize the same solution in terms of uh, A. So you can either use A with a condition P bigger than zero as a mm. parameterization or with the same condition you could equivalently use uh, the one over A. Mm. And both lead, both describe the same solution. That's that's indeed a key point uh, mm -hmm. that indeed that here, here shows up. Uh, okay, let's see how much I can do in the remaining ten minutes. But uh, maybe I can bring it to which line. So. Uh, so now, now the program is uh, want to quantize uh, f uh, uh, alpha s f r alpha s. The names are going to be then similar, but with capital letters. All these objects and um, the ansatz is going to be of the form. The alpha of x and t, I can also write rather mm -hmm. plus minus integral along imaginary axis uh, over screening numbers. There's some def possibly deformed coefficients here which we need to find. Um, alpha s and uh, f s alpha plus uh, f bar alpha s of x minus. So that's now our ansatz. And uh, now I will introduce the building blocks for, for i. And uh, uh, well, maybe before I do that, uh, I want to uh, mention the main condition that we want to satisfy is such that uh, the alpha uh, again of course to be understood in the distributional sense is zero well for equal times t here in the arguments this is what is called locality and what some of you will know um, this condition is uh, by well, some general results on the relation between, say, this Euclidean formula <coughs> that we discussed uh, yesterday <coughs> to the Minkowskian formalism. It is closely related, but somewhat non trivially so, to the crossing symmetry constraint on correlation functions. So, this is basically here. I mean, everything in the story with using, say, path integral and crossing and bootstrap basically has a counterpart in this story. This is the remark I want to make, where basically crossing is this condition, or equivalent to this condition, somewhat non trivially so. And uh, then basically, well, the normalization of these guys combined with these coefficients will be giving DOZZ three-point functions. So it's all there here in this expression uh, already. This is a side part, which is, of course, uh, not really understandable at this point. but. Uh, it's, it's just to indicate, uh, yeah, there's a one-to-one -one translation. Okay, so yes, I at least should manage to write down the building blocks and uh, write down the proposed definition for these guys before I conclude. Uh, it was just some <coughs> final remarks, maybe. Yeah, the building blocks are to some extent standard, but... Uh, we have to revisit them from some analytic uh, new perspective uh, now. So uh, maybe x plus um, we define to be equal to 2 alpha pi 
Later, five plus, so these are these quantized um, parallel halves of the free field. We enforce here a standard uh, normal ordering description. P plus, and okay, here we have the P plus. Probably we plus, uh, where. You have seen this before. These are uh, exponentials of the free field, which are standard gadgets called vertex operators, which uh, appear as building blocks uh, in, in many, many uh, conformal theory uh, applications. So this is absolutely the standard guy here. And the more interesting thing is what we want to build from it in a moment. Um, and maybe it's better to put it over here. Um, yeah, screen charge, right? So now that is basically the quantum version of of uh, this uh, A field. Uh, this we now call Q. And uh, we just want to be careful about ordering and maybe some useful normalizing factors, which I introduce like this, but don't worry too much. This is more, so for example, this guy is more like conventional and useful for computations uh, rather than uh, very essential. And here we specialize these arbitrary parameter alpha that we introduced into this uh, normal ordered uh, exponential to the value b, which is again sort of yeah, what parallelized h bar, and it's the same b as in the uh, in the lecture yesterday. Um, missing argument. And, uh, to the minus. So and here comes sort of now really the key definition. So we claim right, two times e. that times this exponent into the minus bp. What's it? I mean the exponent that you used twice. And the, no, no, I mean the... Yeah, yeah that, that is uh, meant to be like this. Okay. Uh, just uh, because, yeah, one is to the left. It's, it's an ordering description, right? Because here there is a shift of uh, <coughs> uh, implicit in this. So <coughs> of course you can rewrite, uh, but okay. Somehow the symmetric ordering is, is in this context always convenient. Mm. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just convenience. It's not, again... Fundamental. So we want to. So here is sort of the key proposal, and uh, this is maybe then what I will have to stop with. Maybe after a few final comments. Q of x to the power of s. Uh, this being the screening. <coughs> so I'm doing something funny here. So let me justify uh, that this makes sense. Namely, I stressed I want S ultimately be purely imaginary. Uh, so here I have some operator and I want to raise it to some <coughs> imaginary power. That, of course, a priori is illegal. Uh, we don't know how to do it. Um, however, here um, we are in good shape based on the observations that Q, okay, to begin with, it is an operator. <laughs> Right, unlike this, which is uh, operator valid distribution, so you have to smear in order to get an operator. The Q, as it is integral over E, it is basically uh, something smeared, so it is an operator, but it's an unbounded operator, which, however, at least is densely defined on, say, Fox space uh, states. So it makes sense to think of it as an operator. But the most important observation to make sense of this is that it is positive. Um, so <coughs> on states in some convenient domain, you can check that uh, its expectation value is always positive. Um, uh, because basically, yeah, with respect to the realization of these guys on the Hilbert space we defined, basically this guy here is the Hermitian conjugate 
this guy. So therefore, in the end of the day, you can write this here as an integral over absolute value squared, uh, which is manifestly positive. OK, so this is a proposal for what we should try to insert into these ansatz. And uh, OK, I think I'm just out of time, so let me just uh, end with words. Six minutes. Six minutes. Okay, then I say a few more things. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. No. Then there's one nice remark that uh, this allows me to do. Um. Uh, so where do I want to do it? Okay. This was the last thing I said. Well, before he... Here, well, this is what I want to achieve in order to satisfy crossing locality, so basically physical consistency of the theory. What is different from X prime, right? Uh, X is different from X prime in general, yes. You want to commute so the distribution X is different from X prime. It also commutes with X equals X prime, it's the same thing. But OK, it needs to be understood in a distributional sense uh, uh, anyway, yes. And you also want alpha and alpha prime? Oh, uh, yeah, I think I can be more general here, and it's better to do it, to, to be it, yes. Yeah, so, I mean, OK, I, I just wanted to point out it's a, it's a commutation relation, and if you just start dreaming about checking this using these ansatz, then you will of course see that you need to somehow learn how to commute these guys here when arguments are different with each other. So what you need are um, so this is what we call locality uh, follows well you know the mentioned uh, analytic uh, 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 groundwork that is missing, but say formally, I checked it follows from relations of the following form, the great relations. So let me write down the form. <coughs> so here maybe now I use <coughs> x2 and x1 as the names for the arguments. That is what's called the braid relation. It takes the form dt2, dt1. There is uh, some big kernel, uh, epsilon p, p alpha 1, x2, x1. And then the uh, this notation. So now just reordered and uh, s replaced by t. One and uh, yeah, okay, let me write it down. Um, alpha two t two x two rate relations. The claim is that these are uh, ultimately equivalent to these fusion relations for conformal blocks that we saw in the last lecture, and. Um, I really don't have the time to describe uh, the computation, but there is a computation that basically based on this ansatz uh, deduces formally the existence of relations of the form and uh, allowed me to compute the kernel which appears here, which, uh, okay, perhaps no surprise, turns out to be proportional to, again, these uh, six J symbols that we've seen before. So I have right here proportional to. And uh, of course, we have to somehow uh, uh, explain what the mapping between uh, 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 these arguments here is, which is okay. not difficult, but uh, 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 <coughs> 
Yeah, okay, so, um, yeah, now, now, now I should stop. Um, perhaps one last uh, comment in order simply to connect the two lectures uh, that I've given is that basically if one wants to understand what the relation is between the formal <coughs> uh, that we saw in the last lecture, um, there would be something of the form, I can't give all the details, but uh, it would be something of the form like here. Uh, this would be the Fp of alpha or proportional <coughs> of alpha. Um, if we simply uh, write down uh, the proper map between uh, all the variables appearing on the left and the variables here. So it's basically the same guy that would then be represented simply as a matrix element of uh, these um, uh, basic building blocks, which are sometimes called Carl vertex operators or CVO. So this is basically where somehow the stories reconnect and um, yeah. I would simply love to see uh, at some point um, this be realized uh, completely and rigorously because indeed I think this would, well, uh, it could serve as a means to connect all these four approaches to conformal field theory via relations like this. Um, one could then also, I mean, I dreamt a bit about relating it to confusion at some point, uh, so um, that gives some nice idea about sort of the fusion of aerosol representations by some <coughs> version of the pair of pants. So this is a pair of pants if you look from above, uh, and if you then somehow uh, widen this until you basically have a picture like this, then you see a pair of pants fusion picture of conformal field theory degenerates into basically the gluing of two intervals on the unit circle and that is uh, underlying the main idea of a confusion and so on and so forth. Uh, I believe these gadgets have a chance at least to be useful for making such connections and maybe that's what I want to stop with. <coughs>